It is my great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, An Mina, who will be talking not about the Internet of Things, but rather the things that emerge from the Internet. Now, An is a technologist and researcher and fellow fellow at the Berkman Klein Center. She leads the product team at Midan, which builds tools for global journalism. Anna is also working on a book about the topics that she's going to be discussing today on internet memes and social movements, which is going to be published by Beacon Press. Now, I've had the opportunity to get to know Anna over the last year um, at the Berkman Klein Center through the Hardware Working Group, which Anna and I, together with Jason Griffey, started. We also have the distinction of spanning 15 time zones, um, which is a challenge that is uh, known by all people who produce things in Shenzhen. Um, so it's our own little taste of it. Um, my own research is about the Internet of Things, and so it's been really interesting hearing and learning about uh, An's perspective, which is not about just the technology, but more about the how ideas on the internet can turn into physical objects, and how this process is shaped by people and by social movements. I'm excited to hear more about this today. Please welcome me. Well, join me in welcoming An. Um, I'm excited to speak here because I, I, I kind of became, became acquainted with the Berkman Klein community about four years ago when I spoke at RaffleCon um, 3, um, with Rolling on the Floor Laughing Con, um, with, and on a panel that Ethan Zuckerman hosted about um, internet meme culture globally. And this talk today is kind of an extension and evolution of some of the research that I presented there, and, um, and it's looking at some new trends around object culture and its intersection with internet culture. So I'm going to be talking about hats, if that's um, not obvious from this photo, but I also want to clarify the hats I'm wearing today, um, and the metaphorical hats. I'm a product manager, so I think about products and how products enter the world and how they influence the world and reach new audiences and users. And I'm also a, um, I also look at internet culture and, um, and how that intersects with social movements. I'm interested in kind of the, the social power of the internet and some of its drawbacks as well. Um, and I'm also I'm a little bit of a photographer. So many of these, uh, many of the photos here are photos that I've taken um, in different contexts around the United States and in China. Um, and as I speak, I encourage you to, um, to ask questions. We'll have time afterward for Q&A, um, but also feel free to just raise your hand and, and jump in if you have questions. I'll be talking about two seemingly very different contexts. One of which is political, uh, political culture in the United States in the past few months, as evidenced by this photo. And then I'm going to jump um, to Shenzhen in China, um, southern China, to talk a little bit about commercial production culture over there. And I'm going to try to weave together some threads and themes um, and talk a little bit about the mechanics of object production as it meets a networked culture. Uh, so I want to start uh, with um, a, um, you know, the march uh, from uh, the Women's March from just a, a few months back, and subsequent marches and, and protests that have happened since then. Uh, from afar, it's it's um, it's always a very visually striking movement. Um, you can always see a lot of signs. You can see a plethora of pink hats. Um, and um, and I think what's interesting here is when you start to zoom in and you see how those signs are structured and how they're often intersecting with the internet. It's very much a networked um, sort of protest in terms of its, its aesthetics and media. Um, over the past few uh, over the past few years, we've seen the emergence of hashtags. These kind of digital um, these kind of digital artifacts popping up on protest signs, from Black Lives Matter to hashtag Nasty, you know, reference, referencing the hashtag Nasty Woman um, uh, that popped up after the third presidential debate. Um, these hashtags are very interesting to me because it's a digital artifact that then gets expressed into the physical sign. And why people do that um, is, is an open question. It's something I'm interested in, in talking about. And as those hashtags, that, that hashtag is this, where it's kind of central to the sign. And these hashtags are starting to behave very similar to how, to how we see hashtags on Twitter and Instagram posts, where um, they're, they're kind of um, tying together different signs where the, the main theme is, um, is, the, um, is, is very, is, uh, semantically very different, but then you have these hashtags that tie together those signs in the same way that digital hashtags might connect Instagram posts and tweets. Um, but here it is, here it's happening in the physical world. And then you have other sorts of digital artifacts popping up, There's specifically internet memes. Um, the nope, nope, nope octopus um, has, uh, has popped up in a number of signs uh, they, with these nope, nope, nope signs, so, which are very common um, um, in different protests. Uh, you have the honey badger doesn't care. Um, this time the honey badger does care, and this is a printout of that same honey badger meme. 
Um, and then the This is Fine Dog, which became very popular in 2016, also popping up on signs. And so you're starting to see the emergence of kind of internet meme culture inside the physical signs, which are then photographed. They're, they're designed to be photographed and then pushed back online, where they, they enter the internet meme vernacular. The hashtag why I march um, was a popular hashtag during the march. And there are a lot of number of people like this woman who was encouraging people to actually uh, write on the sign why they march. And she was really riffing off the social media support kit of the Women's March, which had encouraged people to use the hashtag to indicate why they want to march. And so here again, you have a digital practice placed onto the physical sign. And then people were taking pictures of that sign, putting it back online, back on the hashtag. So it became part of the internet vernacular, even though it was happening in physical space. Let's dive, dive into one of these um, kind of viral media. Um, and this, is, uh, this was one of the more popular tweets that emerged um, after, um, after the elections um, that, that came from, um, from progressive circles. Um, and so this tweet from April Daniels, as you can see, got 14,000 retweets, really resonated with a lot of people. And then during the Muslim ban protests um, a few months ago, that same tweet started showing up on signs. Um, because it had gone so viral, it had it started to show up on different signs. And this was one that was in Los Angeles, I believe. And then um, it was then posted on Instagram. And then once again, entered the, the kind of circulation on the internet. Um, these are photographs that I took of variations of that. People were remixing that. Um, this is uh, obviously Grumpy Cat. The reason she had included Grumpy Cat was so she could have a conversation with her children without using the, uh, the, you know, the, um, the, the, the punchline for the original tweet. Um, and then, of course, the, um, uh, and then, um, then other variations where people modified that. And this is in Copley Square in Boston. And so what we're seeing today is protest signs have as their audience and source of inspiration both the physical crowd around them, um, which is where, where traditionally protest signs have done, the wider internet, uh, the, you know, the internet uh, where people are looking at pictures of these signs, and then all the other protests as well. Um, and what we're seeing is an emergence of kind of a shared visual and verbal vocabulary um, of protest signs um, and other objects that pop up around national protests and, and increasingly in international protests in, in many Western contexts. And I, I included this one because this is kind of an indicator of that new relationship with the network because many signs now have, um, have, have words on the back as well because there's no longer this relationship or assumption that the photographer would be in front of you, but also might be part of the crowd, and therefore taking pictures, and therefore maybe might be posting things online. Anyone who's been to these marches knows that there are also a number of hats that have been popping up. And this was a picture I took at the Women's March, um, because it was right after Inauguration Day, of two types of hats. And it was very apparent to me when I entered um, Union Station this, to see pink hats and red hats. Um, and um, very much the association with these two hats was one of, um, you know, one of people going for the, coming for the Women's March and one of people coming for um, the Inauguration Day. And so um, I want to zoom in on the ones on the left first. So these are the, the pink pussy hats. This is the Pussy Hat Project. Started, um, started really the brainchild of Krista Sa in Los Angeles and, um, and became part of a project uh, with the Little Knittery in, in Los Angeles. And I'm going to ask um, if we could start passing out. I actually brought um, some of the pink pussy hats um, and start looking at them um, because from afar they all look very similar. You see the sea of pink heads, um, but in detail they're actually quite different. And the way the project worked was, um, was the Pussy Hat Project um, distributed patterns um, online um, that, that, um, that encouraged people to, to make these kind of pussy hat uh, designs, so these pink yarn designs. And then they prefigured that with an illustration of what that might look like at the march to really inspire people. And this, this, started, this happened about two months before the march, and when people started getting together in knitting groups, knitting circles. And instead of following the pattern word for word or, or you know, kind of script by script, um, instead, um, people made variations of that. And what I want to argue today is that part of these hats, um, these physical hats, are actually following internet meme culture and the norms of internet memes. Um, and as you look at them, um, I'll, start, um, I'll start tying that together. But um, take a look at some of these hats and these variations. Um, these are all variations from DC. Um, from um, uh, here's a black one with the rainbow um, with the rainbow flag. Um, these are also from these are from Maryland. Um, you can see on the sign um, different colors beyond pink. Um, and then this is uh, this is one from Boston. This is a, a pussy hat um, screen prints um, so, uh, screen prints on uh, in Oakland. Um, so people are taking that the basic idea, the basic kernel of it, but often remixing it. And as you're looking at these, you can see in detail that there are actually quite a bit of variation. Um, and there's a loom being passed around from uh, Berkman's own um, Carrie Anderson because she also made some as well um, and used a loom instead of, a, instead of kind of the hand knit instructions. So people often interpreted, reinterpreted the hat um, to their own skills and interests. Um, and 
that was kind of the point. Um, the, the point of the project was that it was networked. Um, the, um, from, these are pictures from the Instagram account uh, for the Women's Smart, for the Pussy Hat project. And um, the whole goal here was that uh, the, the hats were designed so that people who could not attend physically uh, would make the hat. They would send it to someone who was able to attend. That person who attended would then take a picture of themselves with the hat and send that back to the maker. And so the whole point of this was that it was digital, it was networked, and it was participatory um, in a way that combined both the physical and the digital. So what I'm talking about today um, is, um, is that I, I think these, these hats, these signs, and these other objects that I'll be talking about today are part of internet meme culture um, in a different way than, than we traditionally think about objects. So when I talk about internet meme, I want to make a distinction between the kind of Dawkins sense of meme, which is the, um, the notion of the cultural unit, and then the kind of this notion of the internet meme. Um, Lee Moore Schiffman has written about this and helps, you know, helps us make a distinction between, um, between you know, the, the word internet meme has kind of emerged in the culture of the internet as this kind of unique practice, so this thing on the internet that happens um, that's kind of diverged um, like a meme from the original Dawkins sense of meme. So when I'm talking about meme today, when I'm talking about memetics, I'm, I'm typically talking about internet meme memes specifically. And so Schiffman's definition of memes um, is a useful one that I tend to agree with um, that helps us think a little bit about what's going on with these hats and these signs. So a, an internet meme is a group of digital objects that share a common stance, um, form, and content. Um, and so you have this kind of shared, um, uh, shared, shared characteristics. Um, and but there's a platonic form, but no, no one is alike. Um, they're created with awareness of each other. So this is kind of social component to it. And then they're circulated, imitated, and transformed via the internet by multiple users. This last part is really important because this notion of transformation and multiplicity is what makes an internet meme different from a viral object, um, at least, um, at least um, within the definitions that I'm talking about today. Because a viral object might be like the Old Spice video um, that is shared frequently and is looked at and viewed, but doesn't have this notion of transformation. Whereas a, a video like the Gangnam Style video, where people are dancing along, creating their own videos, is more is closer to what an internet meme is, at least in this definition. So the classic example, of course, is the kind of Nyan Cat, um, where, um, and you're looking at the Nyan Cat, um, it has common characteristics of form. Um, there are multiple people creating uh, versions of this. Uh, they're following the 8-bit format, and this idea of a cat with a Pop-Tart, but, um, but often remixing and reshaping it um, based, on, based on their perspectives, their interests, their contributions. And in many ways, the pussy hats follow those same formats, right? Um, and in many ways, um, it's as much digital when you look on Etsy, look on Google Shopping, look on any website and just Google pussy hat, you'll see that wide variety of variation just like you do with digital memes. And I think this is intentional. I think this is people aware of, um, of the fact that they'll be photographed, the fact that these images will be circulated online, and that their contribution will be part of the shared uh, visual language around protest in the United States. Now, there's often a contrast drawn between, um, and especially on the weekend of the Women's March, between the hand-knit um, pink hats and then the red, um, the kind of red Make America Great Again merchandise that, that was perceived to be mass-produced. And again, from afar, it looked like that, right? You see pink hats, you see red hats. But as you dig deeper, you see that um, these kind of mass-produced objects also have this notion of remix and multiplicity that we associate with internet meme culture and, and as I argue here, um, with object meme culture as well. Um, these are photos that I took during the Women's March. Um, this is a man who's wearing a red hat that he had remixed um, because he was, he was campaigning for transgender equality in North Carolina. And so remixed the red hat to reclaim the notion of the red hat for his um, political cause. Other hats included WTF America. Um, this woman had the universal, universalist, Unitarian Universalist principles on her hat. Um, our own Ethan Zuckerman um, made a remix on this to Make America Kind Again. And if we could start passing around the red hats, I think those are circulating now. Um, uh, some of the red hats that I'm circulating include this one from Jeronimo Saldana, who's a activist artist who, who created all these remixes in response to, um, to key phrases and, and things that had been circulating online. Um, and, um, and you can see those hats um, and you can see how they're made. Um, they all take the form, but then they remix it, they modify it. It's a very different process, of course, from the knitted hats, which rely on hand production. Um, and I'll walk through how those are made. But the, the spirit of this is the same, is that any, um, in, with digital objects, we're used to the idea that they never stay still. Um, and now we're starting to see this with certain class of physical objects as well. And I would argue also part of the effectiveness of the hat, if you look at Jeronimo's um, profile picture, is that this becomes a political indicator, a declaration of political allegiance through selfie culture. So once again, the hat is physical, but it's also digital in the same way that screen overlays for marriage equality um, had been a way to indicate political allegiance. You have um, now you have hats as well. And that's part of the effectiveness of the red hats. 
So 2016 was known as the meme election. I think a lot of people were observing this. I think, I'm sure many of us were observing the, the number of memes that were popping up. And, um, but I think what was missing from this conversation was this notion that meme life cycles now include both digital objects and increasingly physical objects. And let's take a look at what I mean by that. You can see in the background some of the nasty woman mugs. Um, so remember during the third presidential debate um, when the Republican candidate said, um, called the Democratic candidate such a nasty woman. I'm sure we, many of us remember this moment. Within seconds, people responded. They created a hashtag, nasty woman, hashtag nasty, as a way of reclaiming that phrase as a, so a source of power rather than, um, rather than an insult. Within minutes of that, there were digital ones. Um, people remixed um, the Janet Jackson uh, album, Nasty, to include um, Hillary Clinton's face. There are comics of these. We're used to this kind of thing happening now. This is the meme election. But what was interesting to me was the product memes that popped up after that. If you search on Google Shopping for Nasty Woman pillow, Nasty Woman cloth bag, Nasty Woman hat, Nasty Woman mug, Nasty Woman pin, Nasty Woman sticker, think about any product and put Nasty Woman, you'll probably find that product, and you'll probably find endless variations of that product in much the same way that the digital memes were circulating. Those memes then, as they shipped, they became part of selfie memes. They were then, um, this, is a, a fun this is a photo from a fundraiser for the Texas Democrats. And then um, they circulate, they circulate, they go back online. And again, this kind of intersection between the digital and the physical, um, where the objects are just as mimetic as the digital objects. The physical objects are just as mimetic as the digital objects. And so I argue we should under extend our understanding of internet memes to include physical objects as well. Um, and a certain class of physical objects are not yet nasty woman computers or cars, or maybe there are, I'm not sure. Um, but for a certain class of physical objects, you have this notion of remixing just as, almost as quickly as digital objects. None of this is a surprise or an accident. Um, since 2008, the Facebook election, the meme election has um, seen a wellspring of technological developments that have, that have made it easy for us to quickly adapt a t-shirt for any idea that we have on the internet. Um, so um, it's easy for us to slap on text, a logo, a, a, a digital meme, and put that on a t-shirt, um, indicate a price, and then um, do some fundraising around that. Um, and then you can get the matching mug as well. Um, sites like Teespring, uh, Vistaprint lets you order just one hat of a, of a kind. Um, so if you just you really feel passionate about that hashtag, you could just get one for yourself. Um, Custom Ink, there's a, there's a hat floating around from Custom Ink, allows you to do this for all kinds of products. They really streamline that process so that, um, um, so that it's uh, much simpler to take your idea into a physical object in the same way that Photoshop has done for, 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 um, for images. And if we follow the, the path of April Daniel's tweet, um, she got so much response from November um, uh, for her tweet that um, she then went on to Teespring, created a shirt using that tweet, and then created a fundraiser for the ACLU. And this is all, um, this is all um, deliberate. Um, Walker Williams, the founder of Teespring, in an interview noted that the, the goal here, the goal with the site, is to bring a product to market um, as quickly as possible, to take care of the production, the logistics of shipping, the logistics of printing, so that all you have to do is have the idea and so you can get it to your audience as quickly as possible. So it streamlines this process. This is why it's just as easy, almost as easy, to type a hashtag as it is to make a t-shirt with that hashtag, because you have, you have tools and processes that make that simple. So I'm going to transition now um, to China. Um, and um, I want you to hold this thought about this idea of outsourcing um, a project. Um, and outsourcing um, you know, sort of the, the tools and the ability to create complex, formerly complex products. Um, and start thinking about this um, in another context, in the commercial context. Um, so um, I want to take you to Shenzhen. Uh, Shenzhen is a, um, is a city, in a, city, a small city of 12 million people um, in, um, in the Pearl River Delta. It's a, um, the, uh, if something is made in China, um, it's probably made in the Pearl River Delta. Um, and if that's something is hardware, it's probably made in Shenzhen. Um, this is the heart, um, this is a, the region of the world typically known as the factory, the world's factory, where, all, um, where the, the stereotypes are made in China. Cheap products, copycat goods, um, things like that um, are popping up and being shipped around the world. This infrastructure um, has also given birth to a new type of object production um, known as Shanjai. Um, and I'll talk about a little bit Shanjai, and I apologize to the non-Chinese speakers, but Shenzhen and Shanjai have nothing to do, with, um, ed they're not related etymologically, although they sound very similar. Um, and, um, uh, but um, uh, Shanjai is really endemic. Um, Shanjai production is endemic to Shenzhen. What we're seeing is right now is a shift in narrative about Shenzhen from made in China to created in China. And in the Western world, um, the narrative is shifting from Shenzhen as the Silicon Valley of hardware. How many of you have heard that phrase, Shenzhen as the Silicon Valley of hardware? 
starting to emerge. Yeah, it's starting to become more familiar as the narratives around what is made in China and how things are made in China is starting to shift. Um, but what interested me was um, at the one plant, um, I was interested in kind of Silicon Valley practices entering Shenzhen, but I was also interested in selfie sticks. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why that is. But um, I'll, let, me, let me define Shanghai for you really quickly. Uh, Shanghai means mountain bandit, um, and it's, um, it's typically translated as bootleg. But in many cases, it's actually a form of open production um, that very much looks very similar to the hat production, to the, to the yarn production, where many, many people are producing objects um, using raw materials. Um, and so if I can ask um, if we can start passing around, um, passing around some of the selfie sticks. I brought, I brought a bunch of selfie sticks from Shenzhen. And again, from afar, they all look the same. But as you look closer, you start to see these characteristics, these common characteristics of form, style, stance. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how this open, um, how this open um, excuse me, a community of production is now intersecting with the internet. Um, so for those um, who, who don't have selfie sticks in your hands, here are some photos I've taken from around the world. Um, this is from New York. Um, this is from Paris. I'm sorry, it's a little dark. Um, this is from Spain. Um, this is, um, these are from China. Um, and the selfie stick is itself an iteration. It's itself a remix of the, produ of the, of the, um, you know, the culture of, of producing tripods. Um, and so you remove the tripod base, and then you get a selfie stick. And so, um, so this, is, this is really the, the evolution of the selfie stick as a form of iteration. There is no one selfie stick. There is no one producer of selfie sticks. There's no one factory of selfie sticks. There's no one shipper of selfie sticks. It's highly, it's a highly multiply produced and distributed product. And yet somehow it went global and became a global product very quickly. And there are a ton of variations. There's ones with mirrors. Yes. Um, yeah, there, there is actually, and we can talk about that actually. So um, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's um, hold on to that note. Um, so um, there's selfie sticks with Bluetooth, um, uh, with Bluetooth triggers. Uh, there's selfie stick. Um, this is a selfie stick that has no trigger because it comes with an app that detects um, when you are um, doing the peace sign, which is a common common sign that Asians use when getting a picture taken, and then it automatically takes your picture. <laughs> um, there's a tiny selfie sticks. Uh, there are mid-sized selfie sticks. All of these selfie sticks are in this high, wide variety of variation. Um, and so when we're talking about patents, for instance, um, the question, of course, is then which, which selfie stick is patented and to what extent is our variations um, covered by that patent or not? Um, and so it's an open question. Um, and so um, put the volume down here, some video from, Shen, from Shenzhen. And Shenzhen, the way Shenzhen works, and this is a um, great description from Sylvia Lindner and Sarah Mavle, who um, wrote about Shanghai is, um, is that it's a network process. It's a very much bottom-up production rather than top-down supply chain management. And what that means is that a small but a quickly expanding network of producers, designers, entrepreneurs, engineers, vendors, and traders are working in a networked way to compete um, on the global, in the global markets um, with, um, um, in, in typically in global south markets to create products um, that, people, um, that um, people want um, but typically don't have access to from kind of top-down supply chain management um, uh, companies. Um, and so Shenzhen is very much a network process. Um, within Shenzhen, um, Shenzhen the city, not Shenzhen the production process, Shenzhen the city, you have um, people, you, you have stores where you can buy the raw parts to make electronics. Um, you can also buy the electronics themselves. The Shenzhen ecosystem has created uh, miniature phones, it's created Bluetooth karaoke mics for your phone, uh, for, um, for your smartphone. And this was, these are phones that were exhibited at the v a Museum um, exhibition in, in the Shenzhen Biennale. Um, and these phones um, are, uh, were, again, a remix of existing phones, but with larger buttons, so that um, el um, elderly people who, or people with visual impairments could actually read, read the buttons. And so our narratives about, um, about the products that come out of Shenzhen as copycats um, really needs to shift to start thinking about this notion of remix that there's a base product um, that people are often riffing off of um, and, then, um, and then making variations that didn't exist before. Yes? You put your own brand on that and, and yeah, sell it. That's right. So that's a, great, that's a great point. So what we're seeing here is an example of white label production. Um, so um, in that notion of brand, it's, it's very similar to the hats, actually. Um, where you can order these phones um, online um, and then place, um, place a brand or a brand identity that, um, um, or a logo similar to the hats and how the hats work. Um, and so, um, so, so these adaptations um, are very much, um, very much designed for people um, to come from the internet um, to say, okay, I want these sort of phones, I'm going to slap a logo on it and then create that. And so it's, it's a good example of white label production as well. 
So the way Shanjai works um, is very similar to how digital content works. And if, if anyone's ever tested headlines um, for journalism articles in, in journalism, people will often test 10 different headlines. They'll throw them all out, see which ones get resonance, and then pick the one that gets the most likes and clicks, and then amplify that one. Shanjai works in a very similar way to digital content in that regard. Products are market tested directly by throwing small batches of several thousand pieces into the market. Um, the, you know, some of the, you know, you can imagine the first selfie sticks, people weren't sure if those would actually reach market saturation or market interest. And so they would just throw out a few hundred and see what happened. Um, and then um, see if people responded and wanted to buy some. And then here, it's actually a very different process from how Silicon Valley typically works. Here, prototyping and consumer testing occur rapidly and alongside the manufacturing iteration process. So as you're throwing things out, as with those headlines, um, as with digital content, you're also getting feedback immediately from buyers. Um, and so that's how Shanjai works. It's very much in this kind of open system. And it's already, um, this, was bef you know, this was really before the internet started to take hold in China. And so as the internet is, is uh, connecting with, uh, with this kind of open network system, uh, we're starting to see um, that the internet is, um, in many different ways, is shortening production time. Um, I did a workshop with uh, Sam Hu at the Shenzhen Open Innovation Lab, which was uh, founded by David Lee, who's a, um, a friend of Berkman and, um, and an advisor at the, at the Digital Asia Hub. And there, they're really you know, studying different styles of open innovation that look different um, from, uh, from our typical definitions in the West about what innovation looks like. And, those, um, and, then, and, um, and so Sam was really arguing, as we did this workshop, is, um, is that the internet is shortening production time. Typically in Shenzhen, um, with the Shanghai ecosystem, a phone can be built in 26, um, in, in, uh, 26 days. Um, a, new phone can be a new phone can be built in 26 days. And Sam was arguing that that um, can be dramatically shortened um, to sometimes as short as two weeks, but prob probably a little bit longer than that. Um, but in any case, um, you, we're seeing increases in efficiency. And um, to break that down a little bit, these are a few examples of what that might look like. Um, so WeChat, how many of you are familiar with WeChat? Chinese language social network kind of resembles um, WhatsApp or Facebook. Um, it's allowed for people to directly communicate with their factory, regardless of where they are. And importantly, it's allowed for user feedback loops so that users, can, um, users of selfie sticks or other products can have direct interaction and contributions with the designers and makers. Um, so you have a tighter feedback loop so people can make those quick iterations that I was just talking about. You have direct sales and e-payment. And e-payment is really important because it means you don't even have to leave your house to buy a new product. Taobao is, um, is another site. How many of you are familiar with Taobao? Um, it's kind of an eBay-like platform, yep. Um, so Taobao has crowdfunding as well. So um, similar to those Teespring hats that I was sharing, uh, where you can test an idea, see how many people buy it before you make a production line. Um, this allows for crowdfunding of different, of different products. It's also direct sales, and Taobao um, really taps into the Shanghai ecosystem because it provides data um, for the things that you're selling so that you can respond just like headlines to the ones that are trending um, and quickly spin up new production lines. Alibaba Express um, is, um, is handles shipping logistics, so the, 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 uh, the, the difficulty of moving atoms across countries um, becomes streamlined. And then there are also Western networks, and this is probably, I'm not sure, this is probably how the, the, uh, the selfie stick, the hoverboard, um, e-cigarettes uh, first started emerging in Western contexts um, through Kickstarter, through Amazon, um, through, uh, that allow for crowdfunding and direct sales online, and then also through Instagram. Um, Instagram is a key, key way that, um, that a lot of the Shanghai ecosystem is tested in global markets um, and, um, based, on, based on likes and shares. Um, so people can, again, just like with digital content, test an idea before committing to the full thing. McKinsey's done a report on this on wired companies, um, and so um, there's a number of um, you know number of benefits that a company gets when they when they connect uh, with um, connect with the internet, and um, and obviously there's this kind of boost in productivity. Um, but as we saw with the t-shirts, that as, it, as you get an increase in productivity, you also get a flowering of creativity. Um, so points four and five are really relevant to this conversation, where you have these lower barriers to innovation. It's lower barrier to production, to creation, so that once you have an idea online, it's easy to realize that and actualize that in physical space. And then also new competition, because um, it empowers entrepreneurs and small business. We can debate that point, but, um, but the point here is that it's easier for an individual with a random idea to make, that, make, it, make a product and then test it in the global market. And selfie sticks, again, are a good example of this, um, of that, because selfie sticks are um, they're kind of a spectacle. Um, this is a selfie stick with a light. Um, and, um, and it's a spectacle when it's being used. 
Um, and people are compelled to take a picture of it. Um, when they take a picture of it, um, they post it back online. And then people are wondering, oh, where did you get that selfie stick? So just like those digital memes, it becomes the selfie stick becomes part of digital meme culture and internet meme culture. Um, and, um, and then those sales on Instagram um, are circulating on the same networks on which, on which some selfie stick memes are circulating. So if we can imagine, this is a very rough diagram. This is much rougher than the other one. But if we can imagine um, the kind of meme sparking event, I'm sure we all remember the first time we saw someone using a selfie stick and how, how odd that looked. Um, and the kind of compulsion to take the picture. Um, that picture, as it circulates online, it, it's, it's being watched. Um, people are looking at the trends of selfie sticks, which ones are circulating, which ones are popular, where are they coming from. And then, and then you can, um, in, the, in the Shanghai ecosystem, people can create a variation. Post that online, test that on Instagram, test that on Taobao, um, test that on, on other sites. And then, um, and then get feedback from their users. Um, and then, um, and, then um, and oftentimes they often bypass the physical markets. They just rely on the internet as a means of distribution. And so the, the, object, the object distribution um, is looking just as mimetic as kind of the, the way that the digital representations of those objects are spreading. Um, and, then, um, and then finally, um, if it goes into the physical markets, it's often reached a certain scale. Um, and so at that point, um, it becomes like the selfie stick, a global product that you can now find in pretty much every major tourist site around the world. So memes, um, internet memes are interesting just as a cultural practice, um, and, and they kind of feed into the kind of human interest in remixing and riffing. Um, I think, um, um, and as we think about, as I think about memes, I often think about technological enablers. I've been looking at memes in a variety of global contexts like China, Uganda, Kenya, United States, and it depends. Uh, the meme culture often depends on the technological culture and the technological capacity of the context in which memes operate. And so um, early memes, early hashtag memes, um, often uh, sprung up in the dial-up context or in low bandwidth context. Um, and so the technological ability to distribute memes um, uh, limited people to text and hashtags and ASCII art. Um, and so they use networks like Blogspot or Twitter, and then you have the production capacity for keyboards and computers. Photos and videos, as broadband comes around um, in different contexts, that's when photo and video memes start to emerge. You start to see the remixes of videos, uh, YouTube videos, uh, Vine videos, et cetera, um, enabled by broadband and mobile broadband. Um, and then also the emergence of networks that allow people to have that kind of shared space that's so important to internet meme culture. And then also the production of this. So you need, you need smartphones, you need cameras, you need editing software to really effectively make a visual meme. And I argue that we're at that stage now with objects. And what I mean by that is that um, we have a means of distribution. Um, we have simple ways that simplify that, UPS, SHIP, Alibaba. And then you have networks that, sh that allow for sharing Ravelry for knitting networks, Taobao for hardware, um, Amazon for other types of products, Thingiverse for 3D printing. And then you have a means of production as well. You have the Shanghai ecosystem in China. You have maker spaces and knitting spaces in the United States. You have 3D printers as well. Um, and then, and to some extent, um, distribution can also happen on the internet. This is most true with knitting patterns and with 3D, you know, kind of scripts for 3D printing, where the, uh, the raw materials are local, locally available, but the distribution of the code to make, that, make those raw materials into objects um, can be done through the internet. So to conclude, um, I want to just kind of share three points. Um, one is that object memes reflect an aesthetic rebuttal to this notion of digital dualism. The idea, digital dualism is the idea that the digital world and the real world are separate. And we often talk about the real world and the virtual world. But as we see the intersection of internet memes and object memes, we're seeing that internet culture is influencing culture more generally, and vice versa. Um, and so it's, 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 uh, I don't think it's useful to think of internet culture as entirely separate from the culture at large. And we're starting to see that literally manifesting itself in protest culture in the United States. The internet meme framework is also a useful way to understand a certain range of object production, a certain sort of informal production that combines networked modes of production, similar to Shanghai or the, um, the, the hat printing, um, with the global reach of the internet and global shipping services as well. The ability to move bits and atoms with just as much ease and efficiency. And then thirdly, thanks to key technological enablers, like these sites, like white label sites um, that allow for, for us to interface with the makers and producers, we're seeing more than gains in efficiency. We're also seeing a burst in creativity from a multiplicity of people. Um, and so um, as you get that kind of ease of production, you also get an increase in creativity. And so objects produced in this way start to behave like digital objects. They're remixable. They never quite stay still. They're informal. They're produced by individuals, and they're, they're not uh, produced with kind of top-down supervision. And they, they appear to be random, uh, much to many people's consternation, but also to many people's delight. 
and that randomness is, is, is a key part of this. Is, um, as you look at the objects, they, you know, a year ago, they would have seemed completely random. So that's, um, that's the conversation. Um, that's, those are the notes I wanted to share. Um, and in true Shanjai fashion, I just wanted to throw those out there and then um, get, get feedback and let other people guide the conversation from here. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. That was super interesting. Um, I was wondering, are there different characteristics of an online meme that make it more likely to cross over into the physical? You gave a, a few examples of political memes. Yeah. Are there things that have to do with identity, or what kinds of demographics would yeah. be more likely to, to, to engage in this? Yeah, yeah, that's a very, that's a very interesting question. I do think that it, it um, because, um, because when we're, especially when we're talking about hats and t-shirts, um, those are identified, those are identified, ident identity signals. Um, in protest culture, um, before the internet, we had buttons and pins and stickers, um, and bumper stickers um, as a means of, of you know, connecting our political identity with kind of a physical object that either we wore in our person or that we drove around with. Um, and so, so I do think that, um, um, at least in, in the political context, um, often the, the, um, the digital memes that, that have to do with self and have to do with a strong sense of self or strong sense of emotion tend to do very well. A, a recent one is She Persisted, um, the, um, you know, the kind of meme that popped up um, you know, in, response to, um, you know, in response to the phrase, never, you know, she, uh, she spoke up and uh, something like she spoke up, we told her to be quiet and nevertheless she persisted, right? Um, and so for Elizabeth Warren. Um, and so um, things that evoke strong emotion tend to, tend to pop up um, more frequently in these kind of physical objects. Thanks. Yes. I think a mic's coming around. Yeah. There's something very attractive about the production model that you showed in China. By I recall hearing about one of its disadvantages about a year ago, which is remember the exploding hoverboards. Yes, absolutely. And it sounds like they came from a system like this, where yeah. there were many different manufacturers. Yeah. They were they were weekly branded or unbranded. Okay. And it was really impossible for anybody, whether you were, you know, an airline or a store that wanted to sell them, or a consumer or Consumer Reports magazine. Nobody could really tell what were the safe models and which weren't because the branding was so weak and the production was so distributed. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Sure, absolutely. I think that's absolutely right. I think I completely agree. Um, and I think this is why I, I often reference digital meme culture because digital meme culture, as we know now, is not always rosy. Um, there's a lot of fake digital meme, digital memes floating around. There's a lot of unregulated memes. So we don't know if it's what's real or fake. Um, yeah. Multiple sources. Yeah, that part I'm less sure of. Um, definitely hoverboards, um, because of this weak regulation, and um, and because multiple people can produce this, right? And, and there's this competition for lower price, lower price with maximum sales, right? It's the same dynamics that we see with digital memes. Um, as we think about content that circulates online, it's often um, um, it's often not necessarily reliable. We don't know, um, and we often need an extra layer of verification um, and checking. And so, um, so absolutely, these um, these informal modes of production um, uh, with physical objects tend to inherit the same problems with digital memes. Um, already are, we see in, in, uh, in the digital context. Um, so I think the hoverboards are a very good example of that. Fortunately, selfie sticks don't explode. Um, um, this one might because it does have a battery. Um, and, uh, and what you do have is e-cigarettes um, made in the ecosystem that do explode in your face. Um, and so um, the lack of regulation is a risk just as it is in digital context. Yes, I think there's a microphone. I think the problem with the phone was the design of the battery case had somehow been rounded, and it was smaller than spec, so any battery would have been bad. OK, OK. Do you know the process of which, by which the, those batteries are made? No, but I just saw the tech reports. You saw tech reports. It was the case size, the design of the battery itself. OK, OK. We should have blamed it. Did you say the 2016 election was the meme election? Um, a lot of people said that. Yeah. Yes. I'm, I'm wondering what the memes were on the among evangelicals or conservatives because I, I think it was yeah. used there as well. Yeah, absolutely. W what are some examples? Absolutely. On deplorables. That side? Um, if you if you look at um, hashtag deplorables, so when uh, Hillary Clinton um, referred to many of Trump supporters as a basket of deplorables, um, it was the same practice of reclamation um, of the, of what was intended as an insult um, into a form of empowerment. And so you have. I'm a, a deplorable. Right. Excuse me. 
like I'm a deplorable. Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. And so if you search for t-shirts, hats, mugs, uh, cloth bags, uh, pillows, you get the same phenomenon. And so you have the deplorables hashtag, the deplorables memes. You have deplorable, um, which is a physical gathering on inauguration day, and then you also have the physical objects. So um, this kind of uh, meme ecosystem exists just as much um, on uh, the right as it does on the left, and um, and with other circles as well. Did it, I wonder if it won the election for him? Uh, there, there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a it's debatable. There's a conversation around that. Um, uh, meme practitioners on the right refer often to meme magic um, that helped um, that helped elect Trump. Um, and so, um, uh, yeah. I, I, but when I think about when we think about memes uh, um, and, and influencing elections, you know, I would, I would argue that we really need to think about the, the larger media ecosystem um, and how the memes relate to that. Um, and so, um, so I think it's a more complex question than simply looking at the memes. If that makes sense. Thank you for this really thought-provoking talk. Um, I take weird factory process tours. Um, so I've got a comment on that last question and another question for you. Sure, please. Um, swizzle sticks. Um, I've actually toured uh, the factory that's the major swizzle stick manufacturer in the United States. Where is it? And there, um, you know, their secret sauce is they figured out how to combine inkjet printing with an injectable, you know, plastic mold so that they can do custom swizzle sticks. Mm. Um, and it's an, so that's another sort of example that you yes. probably wouldn't come at yeah. through these normal means of, of, of seeing that. Yeah. Um, um, another factor I've toured and this was a number of years ago, was a light bulb factory in Ohio. Okay. Um, and like any, like a lot of factories you might tour, the first question you end up asking is, why are you still here? You know, why are you still in the United States and you know, not being produced in China? Um, and their answer was Walmart. Um, it turns out that um, Walmart's product cycle time for light bulbs, like seasonal light bulbs for Christmas, um, is too short for you know the the slow boat from China, right. as it were. Right. So my my question is, I mean, what's the shipping network for these products that make them sort of memeable at you know internet speed? Has there been some you know you know the is there something about them that lends them to um, you know, air shipment, et cetera, mm -hmm. rather than being stuffed on a, you know, a freighter that's going to take weeks and weeks, mm -hmm. um, thus completely changing the iteration time. Right, right. Yeah, I think um, with, with many, um, because of the, the particularities of, uh, of the Pearl River Delta, um, it's long been, because it's been the factory of the world for so long, shipping networks have to go through there. Um, and so, um, so what, you, what you often see with informal production and, and, and kind of informal um, you know, uh, makers who, who are not, you know, um, you know, who are not part, necessarily part of those shipping networks, that they're able to piggyback onto existing shipping networks um, and so to get the products out there. Um, it's not particularly fast, um, but it's much faster than before um, because, um, because of those efficiencies. Um, and so, um, um, and then um, what sometimes happens, and this is, um, this is, this is more on the speculative side, but um, what, I've, what I've been uh, talking about with, with people who, who do the kind of global distribution of some of these informal objects is that, um, is that the one, they'll test it on Instagram Right, and then they'll actually fly someone over, um, someone who might be flying back to whatever context it is, to then start showing them around um, and put them in a shop, see if people buy that, um, and so that that's one way that people skim over. But there is still, of course, the limitation around the the, the, the shipping. Um, something that's important here is also the logistics of shipping, which is customs, packaging, things like that. Um, and that's part of what makes things faster is that you have infrastructure that makes it much simpler to do that. And I think an American analog is a product called Ship, S H Y P. Are people familiar with Ship? Um, SHIP is, allows you to just take a picture of an object, um, and then someone will just show up, pick it up, uh, package it, and ship it for you. Um, very, very easy, right? So um, the, the ability to move the object is still bound by, uh, by geography and laws of physics, um, but all the other logistics are streamlined substantially by services. So. Great. Um, I'm going to go off script for uh, a second. I'm just curious, um, who in this room has engaged in making a physical version of an internet meme in whatever way you, you see that? Oh, really? 
So I was also curious about like demographics yeah. of who who's most engaged in this, and also yeah. is this mobilizing communities uh, or demographics that wouldn't ordinarily be engaged in internet memes? Yeah, yeah. So the demographics that I'm, I'm noticing um, tend to be um, uh, people in their twenties, um, so people with a little bit more access um, you know, beyond like the, the kind of digital memes, because these are people who are, who are organizing events, um, and so. Um, Geronimo Saldana um, is a good example of, of someone who, um, who is an organizer, an activist, um, who wanted to use hats as a way of galvanizing people to come out. And, and I think there's something important there um, about the, the kind of physical manifestation in, in terms of social movements, um, because by, by putting on these hats, by putting on these shirts, um, people, um, you know, people indicate once they're in a crowd that they're part of that crowd. Um, so when you have photographs, and that's why these pink hats are really important, um, there's no ambiguity um, about who's there. It's, it's kind of a direct address to misinformation networks around, um, around like uh, around what, what what crowds are gathering. So so often we see pictures of crowds that are uh, misused. Um, you know, the photos of the LA protests that were actually from Venezuela a few years ago. Um, and so, um, but with the pink hats, it was, it was a very clear code that this was happening, particular to this event. So. Um, so in, in, term, um, in terms of demographics, I, I do notice that it's more common with activists and the people that activists are trying to, to kind of organize and rally. Uh, uh, Rachel's question sparked this question in my mind. Um, have you looked into culture surrounding turning memes into Halloween costumes or the cosplay community? Yes. Um, yeah, I haven't looked formally, um, but there, there, um, there's an annual gathering in New York called Hollow Meme. Um, uh, for Halloween, where people dress up as memes. Um, and so um, I think looking at creative communities like cosplay, like um, even street art, um, uh, those, these kind of creative communities, um, you know, long before these object cultures that I just referenced, use the internet as part of their sharing and their, their kind of inspiration. And so you have, you have networks where people can, um, can post their ideas, post, their, um, post like their tips, and then other people in other contexts can then do the same. And so what's interesting about looking at this in protest culture is seeing how that, again, establishes kind of visual and verbal vocabulary that makes a protest in Chicago, in Seattle, um, in, in San Francisco, in New York, all kind of feel the same um, in terms of the media objects. Um, but I think you have the same phenomenon with other creative communities. Um, knitting, certainly long before the pussy hats, um, was, um, was a very important. Um, it was very important that it was um, also a networked community um, as much as it is physical. So, yeah. Yes. Yes, uh, I don't know how relevant this is to what you were t talking about, but uh, my favorite cap was uh, from Norway, and uh, it was mostly red, and it had a white and blue stripe, but people kept stopping me on the street mm -hmm. and uh, wanting to know if I was a Trump supporter. Uh, finally, my wife said, you know, wearing that cap is just not a good idea. So I think I think what, you know that's a, that's an interesting example of how symbologies can be transformed, uh, the kind of the hegemonic meaning of a symbol, like a red, like a baseball cap and a red baseball cap, um, that you know at once you know before might not have meant anything in particular, it might have signaled allegiance to a sports team, um, but that uh, that can then be um, can then um, have its meaning overtaken by a larger kind of a larger um, collective of people who agree to to a certain meaning of that symbol. Um, and, and I think that's why it's so important to also understand the kind of remix cultures that emerge out of that. Um, because what people are doing is responding to that hegemonic symboli symbology of, um, of the red hat and trying to transform it into another sort of meaning. Um, and so you have the Make America Mexico Again hats. You have um, um, Jose Antonio Vargas, who's an immigrant rights activist, created a um, Immigrants Make America Great red hat. And that's on his Twitter handle. Um, and so the, these attempts to, to reshape the symbology um, are, sh should be seen as activist, um, activist actions that, that, um, that try to change the meaning of these things. And whether or not that's successful is a different, um, a different debate. Uh, from a non-advocacy um, stance, sure. I'm, I kept thinking about um, films, like yeah. blockbuster films even, or perhaps larger indie films that could, um, like a hybrid. So yeah. you have these marketing of products, right, that go along with Disney or something like that. And I'm wondering if there could be or if that would work for them to connect with the bottom-up approach to get their uh, products connected to the film more widespreadly, widespreaded, marketed. Absolutely. Um, there's a different talk I could give that would be for marketers. Um, that would be basically, basically the same slides, but with different talking points. I think um, when we're talking about uh, marketing and, and film distribution, 
um, you know, when, when people listen in on hashtags or on, on trending memes about any given um, kind of um, any given movie, um, they're also listening for how the audience is responding to that, right? Um, and um, and I'm, I'm, I can think of one example that's not quite a film, but is, is kind of related, is uh, Lego. Um, Lego um, had, you know, for the long time, longest time, distributed instructions for how to use Lego. Um, and they noticed that people um, were um, were sharing tips on how to make other kind of Lego products, um, you know, make other kind of Lego combinations. And um, there, for a while, there's a little resistance, but um, but uh, pretty soon they embraced that kind of bottom-up production and then created Lego communities so that people could um, could share that. So, um, so absolutely, I think there's a lot of value for for marketers or people who are trying to promote a brand um, to to think about this, um, you know, beyond the social movement context. Um, and um, um, and you know, I'm pretty sure I can find an example of a branded selfie stick or a branded hat that, that kind of uh, dips into this, but uh, no, no, no specific examples come to mind right now. Yes, I think it was the mic. Um, I just wanted to reintroduce a question that got asked earlier and you put sure. off, which was about yeah. the patents and selfie sticks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the, the, interest, the history of patents of selfie sticks is actually very interesting. Um, uh, the, the first patent that I'm aware of was, um, was by a, uh, a Japanese man um, um, I'm going to misquote this, so I'm going to spread misinformation, but it's, um, I think, in the 70s, um, who um, who'd created a, a kind of selfie stick-like device um, that wasn't quite ready for the market because you didn't have smartphones. Um, and then you see selfie sticks in chindogu, which is a, a Japanese art of, of creating useless inventions. Um, and I think that was in the <laughs> Yeah, that was in the 80s. Um, and so at, back then, it was deemed as, as a useless invention. But again, because the cameras hadn't caught up, the networks hadn't caught up. Um, and then there was, a, I believe he's Canadian, um, created another patent for a selfie stick. Um, but um, and thinking about patent law is a little outside my um, my. Right now, right? Excuse me. Um, many of them, yeah, I believe so. Um, but also, there's this question, and a patent lawyer would have to comment on this. Given the variation of selfie sticks that you've seen, um, does the patent cover all those variations? Because again, when we look from afar, it always looks like there's one selfie stick. But when you actually go into depth into what's happening in Shenzhen. Um, there's actually a wide variety of variation, um, and the, the original patents probably look very different from um, from this one with the light, for instance. I have a, a follow-on question, which is, in your research or in research of other people, do you know of anybody that's mapping out the evolution of some of these memes, especially with the physical part? Like, I'm curious about the selfie stick, like how it spread. Um, do you know of anybody doing that kind of work? Um, no, I'm not actually. If, if there's other people who are familiar with this, that'd be great. I'm, I'm actually interested in, in starting to map one of these. Um, I suspect um, I've, I have two hunches right now, um, and I'll just I'll just say them on record: is um, that the karaoke mic um, for smartphones, and also certain types of Bluetooth headphones, um, might be the next kind of thing that, that kind of uh, that kind of percolates um, in global markets. Um, and so I'd be really interested in working with someone to track that. Um, the logistics of that are very difficult because you need people who can work, go to factories, visit them, um, see how those are made, and then track that online, and then start tracking the global distribution. Um, much of the production out of Shenzhen um, is, um, is designed not for US or Western markets, but for global markets in Africa, um, parts of Asia, and Latin America. And so you need, you need a pretty broad research network to really follow that. But um, I'd, be, I'd be thrilled to, do, to work with people on that if, if there's any interest. Because in, in, 18, in the 1800s, uh, studies of the demographic transition showed that patterns of changing fertility went by language groups, very fine language group mm -hmm. divisions. And I wondered if anyone's looked at the role of language, especially in non in Africa or in places where there's a wide variety of languages and pretty low bandwidth. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's another core interest of mine is actually language barriers on the internet and how that, um, how, um, how language barriers exacerbate existing inequalities. Um, and so um, there's actually a big challenge with uh, Shanghai makers. Um, uh, most of them only speak Chinese, obviously. Um, and, um, and if they do speak English, it's, um, it's, it's not necessarily vernacular or fluent English. Um, and so there's a strong interest from, from Shanghai communities. Um, they can make things, but it's very hard for them to, to kind of market it um, and get it out there to the broader world, it, just in English, English alone. Um, and so, um, uh, so a lot of Shanghai makers will just make something, but it won't necessarily see the light of day um, because, um, because you kind of have that gap from production to distribution and marketing. 
Um, and so, um, so certainly, um, in other contexts, we can extrapolate. I don't have specific examples. But everything I've looked at have been typically majority languages of a given country. Um, so it might be English, Spanish, Indonesian, but not the indigenous languages or local languages. Um, and so um, um, on the other hand, um, because, um, because these are physical objects, because, um, because digital meme culture is often language agnostic, um, there, uh, these things tend to spread regardless. Um, and so, um, uh, but uh, yeah, that's largely speculation. I haven't uh, dived into that specifically. Well, uh, during your talk, you spoke briefly about how uh, companies use Instagram to market their products. Can you speak a little bit more about sure, that? Absolutely. So, um, so the way that an Instagram marketing might work is, um, is a company, um, and typically these are small shops, um, who have a physical stall. Um, so this is an extension of the idea of, of, of physical stalls, and which is very common in China, um, where a small individual will have like a small shop with like their, their, um, their products. Um, but to extend their network, they'll often use a place like Instagram or WeChat um, to market so specific products they have, and then test that with likes um, and see if people are interested in principle to the idea. So this becomes a low-cost way to test it. Very similar, and again, I, I use this um, analogy of headline testing for, news, for newspapers, um, for online newspapers, because it, it's a very similar process to that, where um, you know, with newspapers, they'll test 10 different headlines, and they'll see which one really percolates. Um, and it's very similar to that with Instagram. And the, the Instagram strategy um, is, is very common in the global south. Um, and, and part of the reason it, 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 it is that common is because people are already there on Instagram, on their mobile phones. And it's much less of a hassle for someone to just scroll through Instagram than it is to go to a dedicated website that might not be mobile ready. Great. Makes sense. Let's have another round of our applause for An. Thank you. Thank you.